Great. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining. So, this webinar is about Verify One's Share Anywhere, where we'll be exploring the future of digital identity. I've got some fantastic co-speakers with me today, um, and so we're just going to jump right in uh, and introduce you to the others on this panel. So, let's start with Mike. Uh, please tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. All right, Yulin, thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Tukin. I am the CEO of Onfido, and Onfido is a global leader in digital identity verification uh, and uh, fraud detection and KYC compliance. And what that means is we allow our customers, who tend to be companies like financial services companies, banks, uh, um, travel companies, and so on, to verify, confirm who their customers are and do that using a smartphone in a form of, of um, government-issued identification. We confirm that indeed there's a real person there, that their biometrics match whatever identification doc they have, and that that document is indeed a, a, a valid doc. And we do that worldwide uh, and allow our customers to really streamline their onboarding process and make sure they meet their local regulation requirements. I'm excited to be here. Uh, thanks, Mike. And over to you, Adam. Uh, thanks, Elin. Uh, just a brief background on my my experience. Um, I've been in technology and security and travel for about 31 years now. Um, I was with Congress. I was in charge of air traffic control modernization, among other things. And when 9-11 happened, I was one of a handful of people uh, the government turned to to create the new travel and transportation security system. And so as we're trying to figure out how to make the world more secure, we stumbled upon some issues with identity that kind of have led us to where we are today. Uh, so I left the administration in 2008 and decided to take my learnings and the opportunities we saw uh, while working with the government to create AirSide. I think um, our biggest success is probably known or best known for Mobile Passport, um, which was a public-private partnership between the Airports Council and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, and AirSide to let people clear customs using their phone. We had 10 million users and uh, we saved about 20 million hour, 20 million hours of standing in line. Um, so this was really our first proof point that people actually do want to use their digital identity from their phone and that we can actually provide this uh, a great benefit to the traveling public. So we use, we took this backbone that we built um, so AirSide has always been very privacy focused. We have never seen anyone's personal data across our system. We can't mine it, we can't sell it, we can't share it, we can't lose it. And so we took that technology and we made that the basis of the AirSide platform, and which has really put us in the position to be the leader of, pri of private digital identity sharing. Uh, it puts uh, the, our patented system really puts the control back into the hands of the individual. Uh, we're trusted by the US government, uh, American Airlines and others, and millions of people use us to uh, save time while protecting the privacy. So along the way, we realized that uh, we can provide um, long-term success by creating these trusted technologies or trusted connections. And so that's what our technology is based on. Fascinating. We're going to dive a bit deeper into some of that. So, hi, I'm Yulin. Uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer at Onfido, and I'm also the moderator of today's discussion. And after um, the conversation we'll be having, we'll also be answering questions. So, please pop your questions onto the questions tab in the app. Um, so, we are obviously seeing a huge shift in the digital identity landscape uh, in the 14, 15 years or so since smartphones be, uh, came about it's now become completely ubiquitous i think most people are afraid always to leave the house without their phone uh, and we're also using it to control more and more of our lives so i think according to juniper as early as 2026 which is only two or three years away over 60 percent of the global population is except, expected to adopt a digital wallet and manage that from their phone as well uh, we've seen especially in the last three or three years how the pandemic has taken us um, from a fully digital 
lifestyle to a more hybrid setup where the things that happen in your mobile and what's happening in your life starts becoming really connected and you need to use your phone to be able to access things or use the device to prove your um, status or a check-in. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of these trends. Um, is this why uh, Onfido and Airsai came together, Mike? Well, let's go back to the beginning. You talked about the last 15 years. The way, the opportunity that we saw is that the digital identity landscape really hasn't evolved along with the market. What happened back when remote digital identity verification was created a dozen years ago is we took a an in-person process and you know made it digital, which is great. I mean, it's a huge improvement. If you used to have to sign up to a, um, you know create a bank account, you'd have to go into a bank branch with whatever your identity documents were, prove who you were, uh, and then drive back home again. You know, we took all of that and digitized it. You can now do that with a smartphone and wherever you are, whenever you want to do it. It works, you know, now, you know, fully, uh, you know, electronically, it's fast, it's safe, it's convenient, uh, and it's more secure and it gives it better accuracy, you can detect fraud better than the old way. But the process, is still the exact same. And what that means is we're oversharing in a couple of important ways. Like the first way is for every um, company that you want to apply to, if you want as a consumer, you want to apply to two different banks or a bank and a uh, trading house, uh, and then you want to sign up for uh, a hotel to so be able to do remote check-in. Uh, you want to sign up for a, a um, car rental company to be able to rent cars. All of those steps, you're going to have to keep going through the exact same process over and over and over again. Boy, that seems like a lot. Wouldn't it be great if you could do that once, store it on your smartphone securely, and then share it? Uh, wouldn't that make it much more streamlined, much faster, much easier, and so on? Absolutely. The other way that we're oversharing is we're sending the whole document with every request. So think about that. I, I ran into this in, in the real world um, two weeks ago. I was on vacation in Italy and checking into a hotel. And the person behind the counter said, can I have your passport? And I thought they were just going to look at the passport. No, they take it back into the back room, take a photocopy of it. And the question you ask is, what on earth are you doing with my passport? I'm just trying to check into a hotel room for God's sakes. So Who's going to have access to it? How are you going to use that? How long is it going to get stored? Uh, what? That's a lot of information to get into a hotel room. We're doing that over and over and over again, right? Which means there's more information spread out in more and more different places. It's the equivalent of taking your wallet and, you know, leaving it out on the park bench or worse, you know, making 100 copies of your wallet and leaving it on every single park bench in the entire park. Um, so it's not a great uh, experience certainly, but it's also not a it's not a secure and private experience. Um, we can do a whole lot better than that electronically. And you know the fraud world is increasing, not decreasing. Um, according to Javelin Research, uh, in 2022, companies lost 43 billion dollars due to fraud. Um, and think about the streamlining aspect. You know the fact you're having to go through this entire re-verification process each time. Well, there's some scenarios for things like buy now, pay later that are directly in the transaction flow where companies are really, really sensitive to adding extra friction. Um, a, a statistics show that uh, companies lose $18 billion a year in lost sales due to um, shopping cart abandonment. So if you can make that into a much more secure one-click uh, kind of experience versus going through that whole um, reproving your identity each time, that makes it a lot more accessible for some of these really important scenarios. So we see this move towards uh, digital identity stored in a wallet, reusability, shareability, user control and privacy management. We think that's absolutely critical. That's where the world's going. We're excited to partner with AirSide to bring that to reality for the entire world. Uh, that makes sense. And, and Adam, how did this come about for you? 
Uh, well, we were th absolutely thrilled to be introduced to Onfido. I think from my first conversation with Mike, when he you know, explained his vision of where identity, uh, we knew it was a fit. I mean, we have always been privacy first. We've always believed that the individual is the key to identity and that you can't have these massive databases. There's just a finite life to that particular um, business model. And so when you look at Onfido, you know, you have the world's best identification technology with a global reach into the most important financial institutions. And then you look at Airside and we have the leading privacy-based digital identity sharing platform with a, uh, with a lot of traction in travel. Putting them to us together, we have the opportunity to do what no one else in the world can do. And, and that's exciting. We can literally transform everyone's the the day-to-day -day lives and give control back to people who felt they had no control, bringing us security and privacy and peace of mind that we each uh, deserve. Uh, it's 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 thrilling as far as I'm concerned. And great, thanks. Yeah, what an exciting um, vision. And actually, some of this is not a vision because it's already happening, um, especially around travel. Um, we just heard about the success of Mobile Passport and uh, some really other exciting partnerships as well. So, Adam, can you tell us a bit more about Airside Today and how it's already transforming the way people travel? All right. Thanks, Elin. So, travel presents a natural opportunity for digital identity transformation. It's a huge market. Um, there are airports, travelers, airlines, and governments, and they all want to move towards a biometrically bound reusable digital identity solution to improve the, the system. We know strong identity matters because of 9-11 and everything. Um, there are a billion passenger trips in the United States alone and four billion worldwide. Uh, so that's, that's already a use. Every time you fly, your identity and data are checked multiple times, beginning with um, as soon as you purchase your ticket. Um, and then you've got to then prove yourself along the way. That means lines. That means your data is being shared across borders. That means your data is sharing between entities. And in order to make all of this work, you have to stand in line. And everybody, everybody hates lines. Um, you know, it drives travelers away, it drives up costs. Implementing the airside digital solution, we can go from plane to beach in 20 minutes. Think about it, 20 minutes. And so that makes something like a weekend trip viable from, from people living in Miami. And so that's what we're talking about. And and when you, you start to make realize how real each standing in line and like, ah, I don't want to deal with customs, I don't want to, you know, I, this is too much of a hassle. What what trips, what commerce, what things do we avoid because it's just going to cost us too much, it's going to cost us too hassle. And so by going towards um, a re working with travel, you really provide a huge value and a stickiness of a proven solution that people, everybody in the system wants. So reusable ID reduces cost, reduces liability, and it improves customer uh, um, experience. Travel itself is built on layers and layers of layers of interconnected global legacy systems. And so as the regulations become more complicated and AI be and the threats become more complicated, it makes using any of these centrally controlled platforms untenable from a regulatory, a privacy and a security um, stance. And so that gives us an opportunity. Governments do not trust the link between the data on your, your boarding pass and the person standing in front of you. That's why you have to pull out your ID over and over and over and over, and that means standing in line. And so every touch point is owned by somebody else, and so every touch point has a different experience. And so you might have to show your passport, you might have to show your driver's license, you might have to show your passport and your driver's license, you might have to show your passport, your driver's license, and your credit card if you're going to a lounge or something like that. And so if you think about all of this, that, um, you know, in order to to take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the, the moving in digital, you've got to be that traveler with one touch has to be able to send the right amount of data to the right place at the right time for the right reason. And so you can't just stick it into the airline system because then it would be on every single terminal in the airport. They don't want that. They don't want your biometrics. They don't want to touch. They don't want their systems to be infected by 
the data that's becoming more and more regulated. Um, and so what this gives us is the convenience of a one-touch ability to get a VIP experience where you've positioned your right to move forward at any of these touch points. Um, it's more convenient. You don't have to pull out your wallet. You keep moving. You don't have to, to say who you, you are. Um, we've proven in the real world that we can be five times faster just from a process standpoint. Um, we saved we saved two million hour cumulative hours of line standing for our passengers, our customers from Mobile Passport. And because you're using the phone, you can apply all kinds of different digital standards and encryptions that you can't otherwise apply to handing a piece of plastic over to an individual. So we, we get speed, we get assurance, we get transparency, and we get um, um, security all with a touch of the button. And so, I mean, I know, you know, a lot of people ask, well, isn't Apple doing the same thing? And the answer is not quite. Um, you know, what sets us apart first is that um, Apple has approved, been approved to do three states in the United States have connected directly to the DMVs and they have agreements with 15 other states and they're going to roll out this solution very slowly over the next 10 years. Um, we are already live and approved with 41 states and all U.S. passport holders. So right there we have 30, 300 some odd million passengers who are eligible to use our system today. Um, we are not limited by Apple's um, walled garden technology. We can work with anyone. We can work with, we are, our open APIs can be tapped into by Google, by the airport operators, by the airlines. Um, and ultimately, uh, it, it allows us um, to be there, be the Spotify to their Apple music. And then lastly, we are partnering with everyone in the ecosystem. So it's not just a matter of you have an ID. We actually are providing the benefits all the way from checking in to dropping your bag to skipping security to passing through customs um, to biometrically boarding uh, on the, the the aircraft. In order to do that, you need a, syst a privacy-based system like Airside, and so that's going to give us the opportunity to roll out benefits that no one else can 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 offer. Um, that sounds very exciting and travel sounds very complicated and like you need a lot of product discovery so if you need some product people to come to Curacao <laughs> any, any <laughs> minute gated beach adventure um uh, it's really I'm interesting from that 20 minute plane to beach myself so I might have to go and take you up on that as well <laughs> we're having lots of volunteers for project managers and and user experience uh, coordinators so I'll put you guys on the top of the list absolutely and um, so we'd love to hear a bit about like knowing now what we know about on and the technology and aeroside and um the simplification of this very complicated space like this travel and um, what specifically was the aha moment when you're like this we need to join forces and be stronger together well you know for us we saw the trends towards digital identity and shareable portable that's stuff we talked about a second ago and the aha the, the, the moment when when we saw airside what was so excited about what we were so excited about with that is the clear high value entry point that you know he um adam just talked about that value that airside brings to the travel scenario. Why is travel great? Well, travel is great because it's a high volume scenario, a whole bunch of repeat users. Uh, it's one that's really high stakes with high security requirements. So the you have to meet a very high level of proof. And so therefore you have a very high secure um, security standard that you're applying to the IDs. Now add that to the privacy protections that um, uh, and the user centricity that Airside brought, and we said, "Wow, this is great." There's a real clear path to building a really high quality set of stored identities, verified identities, and now our existing customers can use those directly. And so we can now offer to our customers, if the user you're trying to enroll is already an Airside member. It's a one-click process. They can say, would you like to share this part of your identity with this customer? And if the answer is yes, one click, you're done. Um, and you get that reusability, shareability benefit. Um, 
And if not, then they can go through the existing process that we already have, and we can just ask at the end, would you like to store this to save time later? The answer is yes, Bill. Um, and so we think we can give just ultimate convenience and privacy and security all in the palm of your hand uh, in creating this shareable identity. Uh, the Liminal um, consulting firm um, believes that that reusable shared identity scenario is going to be about a $250 billion market by 2027. So we're excited about the opportunity to be a major player as this market develops in the coming years. $250 billion, not bad. Um, Adam, what about your perspective? Uh, well, I think actually Liminal underestimates that because they were only looking at the the enterprise. If you look at that report, it's entirely enterprise. And so the difference between what we're doing is that you can do this without an enterprise in the middle. And so my my size of Joe, and I'm going to quote him, it's like, if you want better, cheaper, faster, and more secure, you can only pick two. Well, that's not the case with the Airside Plus on Fido. We can actually create unmatched certainty unmatched transparency, unmatched data minimization, and unmatched control. That's win, 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 win. Um, so by allowing the individual to gather and verify their identity data, create an immutable, trusted digital identity that they bind to their biometrics and then device, and allow them to share as much or as little information as they need to, um, and give them the power to both track and revoke who has access to the data, You've, you've created, you've really flipped the industry on its head. You're, you've, you're creating this new and better type of instant and mutual trust. So one that provides higher assurance, reduced cost, reduced friction, minimal exposure, while putting the control where it belongs, the, in the owner of the data. And so this, like I said, this opens up opportunities for all segments of the economy that aren't necessarily even addressed in the, the uh, liminal report. So very interesting. I think as the, the the future plays out, um, this idea of users having much more control and the ability to have these trusting relationships with the businesses without giving up the like any access of their identity and what is happening with it. Yeah, that's definitely where we see the industry going. And um, I would talk a bit about shareable identity. So. Um, as we know in Onfido as well, we speak with businesses a lot about the balance between friction uh, and user experience and customer adoption. Um, businesses today definitely want to reduce friction uh, to make it easier for customers to interact with their brand at any point in the journey, whether it's onboarding or when the customer wants to do something or especially during unhappy moments, right, when uh, when you've lost your password and you can't get back in and so on. Um, and shareable identity is a really interesting concept to be able to add simplicity and convenience um, so that you do have some way of proving who you are, that the businesses can also trust, um, but also whilst providing privacy, which is the thing you really don't have now or, or control. Um, so shareable identity, this is a full concept. I think everyone's going to be hearing a lot about over the next few years. Mike, what does this what does shareable identity mean to you? You know, you just touched on a whole bunch of it. Right now, the reason why shareable identity is so important is we need to use, as consumers, we need to use our identity to get access to a lot of stuff, both digitally and in the real world. Right? If you want to sign up for a bank account, you need to prove who you are. If you want to rent a hotel room, you need to show identification. If you want to rent a car, you need to show identification. If you want to buy a drink, you need to prove how old you are, which means you need to show identification in the current world. And so all of these different scenarios require you to prove who you are. Um, the way we do it right now is cumbersome. Why not verify once and make sharing really simple, safe, and secure, uh, where you control your privacy and you decide who, who you want to share it with and, and how much. Um, that's clearly the right way to go. Um, it not only gives a, a clear end user benefit, it gives um, businesses benefits because they have a more secure set of identities that are already pre-proven uh, at a simpler experience, which means less drop-off, higher conversion rates. Uh, and um, in addition to the you know, way we've stored it on the device in the secure enclave, a very, very secure way of storing it, there's another security benefit that's worth touching on. Think about the current world 
where identities, generally speaking, are stored in a big online repository. And there are going to be hundreds of millions or more identities in them. Think about all the password hacks even here. That's a version of that because these are big honeypots that hackers can come and try to steal. Now let's flip that around. You move that to a shareable model where it's the identities are distributed on, if there's 200 million identities, they're on 200 million different smartphones. And not only is each one really hard to crack given the way it's stored, but the value you get out of cracking it is you've got one identity that you've just gotten with all that work. The ROI for a hacker is completely flipped upside down. So it just doesn't make sense. It's, it, it's a far, far structurally more secure way to solve the problem and distribute it versus centralizing all that information into one big place that every hacker wants to spend their whole life breaking into because the value of success is so high. So that's why we see shareable identity is it's a win all around. It's a win for the end user. It's a win for the businesses that are working with end users across the whole life cycle. I talked about onboarding scenarios. Yulin, you talked about some of the downstream scenarios of high-risk transactions, about account reset scenarios, and password reset scenarios. All of these things that are being done in much more laborious ways, you can do in much more streamlined and much more secure ways with shareable identity. And, and uh, this I mean, thing makes a lot of sense. We see, we've seen such a growth and prevalence in like the information just being sold on the internet, um, and the idea of people doing that with biometrics, even beyond passwords, I think it's it's pretty um, is inevitable if things are stored in this mass fashion, but also quite scary, I think, for your typical consumer. Um, so, what what it um, what makes this so valuable, important to customers, in your, from your perspective, Adam, and also from the other side as well, from businesses? Sure. So, you know, one of the things, especially about um, some of these knowledge-based questions is that if you as an individual, for some reason, are have different information than in the database, you as the individual are wrong, right? You So, uh, perfect example. My first car was a 1979 blue-green International Harvester. And so, when the question comes up, what color was your first car? It was a blue or it was a green. And so I fail that question almost every single time because I believe my car was registered some years as green and some years as blue. And so as a result, um, I never passed that KYC, but I'm still me. And so I'm identity. Sorry. And I'm sorry to break in, but just having an international harvester makes you just suspect from the beginning. Forget about <laughs> International Harvester Scout Traveler. It's being actually. I had a scout too, and mine was either red or orange, depending on the day. So uh, I, 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 I knew there was a reason you liked it. So you had an orange red, and I had the blue green. Nice. <laughs> I'm harvesting well, more personal information as we speak. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so now, now that 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 particular knowledge-based question is now useless, except for the fact you don't know. No one knows uh, which color those cars were registered under. Um, but when it gets down to it, identity is about trust. Are you who you say you are? Do you have a right to access a location or a service or a product? And do you pose a risk? To answer these questions, we share documents, we fill forms, we present cards, we, you know, we carry keys, we create passwords, we issue tokens, we submit to database queries, we do knowledge-based questions, uh, we share our, base, our, our biometrics. And as Mike was pointing out, as we deal with more and more people in commerce, both digitally and per person, we are sharing more and more of information. Our digital identity breadcrumbs are everywhere across the internet in filing cabinets across the world. And so what ultimately gets to is how do you prove that you are a trustworthy individual? Uh, I think um, it's Peter actually, who's our chief privacy officer and CTO and, um, um, and chief architect always says to prove your identity you have to either it's either what you are what you have or what you know and so what our system allows us to do is answer all of those questions and answer the the questions um, by by creating a single opportunity for the user to do that once and so so as an individual, you don't change whether you're in person or online. 
what changes is what information is needed and who needs it. And so if you can actually create a system where you can decide who gets what, when, where, and why, and you can decide, say, all right, they can have access that they don't access, you flip the whole situation on the head. You reduce friction, you reduce costs, you create a stronger ID, um, you can use near breakable, unbreakable technology, you provide a transparency that is not available otherwise, and you minimize data exposure for both the individual and the relying party. And finally, and this is the most important part, you put the control back where it belongs, in the hands of the person who truly owns that data. And so that's why this is such a powerful, aha, we can turn everything on its head by doing the right thing. And there's very few opportunities like that. It definitely, we definitely see the pendulum uh, swinging from, uh, again, no privacy roles and everyone taking whatever data they want and going the other way, which is actually these personal data and biometrics is something that's very precious and something that you want to own and you want to control and you want to share with you to share uh, rather than having it done for you. Um, we, we speak a lot about this uh, this concept of also identity being quite multi-dimensional and so much discussion about identity kind of really limits it just to your legal identity, whereas actually to be able to do a lot of things, you need to be have a much broader, um, that you have many other dimensions, such as like, uh, do you actually have the right to fly? <laughs> Just because you uh, have a driving license doesn't mean that, or the right to drive, or um, what is your relationship with people you're traveling with, or do you have everything prior? So there, there's a lot of amazing use cases that really open up. Um, Love to hear from you, Adam, given you've been working in this space for a long time. What else do you see um, for the future of digital identity? Well, I think you, you hit your, the nail on the head, um, Yulin. Identity is not your documents. And so the world, much of the world of digital identity is focused on the wallet, which is cards and documents. Your identity is is as core as your humanity. And so your digital identity is actually going to be, as we move forward, core to every part of your, your commerce. It is more than just your data. It's more than your biometrics. It's your relationships. It's your associations. It's your preferences. It's your history. All of that goes to answering you know, who you are. And I think because of the, what we're seeing with generative AI, the bad guys have more tools than the good guys at this point. And so how, what is going to happen? What's going to be the key that gives everybody the ability to be trusted? How do we trust? And so I think in the end, a decentralized user control energy identity will be the backbone of the new economy for both in-person and online experiences. Um, and it, it'll be a key part to protecting us against um, AI driven crime. No more physical cards, no more physical passports, no keys, no tokens. Uh, basically, we'll all be carrying an AI-proof ID bound to us on our device. And so, and when you think about it, that means when, as things become less enterprise-driven, you get more gig economy, more sharing economy, more, you know, person-to-person. -person. We're doing these digital transactions with people we've never met before. And so, this allows us to fill in a gap and let, let verified identity be the backbone of commerce. And that's what I think is truly, truly exciting. Um, essentially, we're building the photo negative of Facebook. And so you yourself becomes Facebook and any, and you share what you want, when you want, um, for how long with anybody. And you think about the kind of the power of Facebook and what it did to the internet, politics, commerce, and even how we relate to each other. And so I think this is, this, the problem with Facebook though, is it exposed all of us. It exposed us to inf non-verified information. It exposed our, our, our information elsewhere. And so as the pendulum swings with governments and the businesses moving more towards privacy and regulation, uh, we think the, I think that the, whoever cracks this decentralized user controlled digital identity is going to be the ultimate winner. Yeah, great. It, it definitely, it has um, changed, uh, I think, the idea of like a private life and your public life for sure. And maybe those consequences haven't uh, fully played out for lots of people. And um, Mike, what are your predictions for the future of digital identity? You know, I think just first looking back for a second, you know, we're moving from phase one where everything was in person to kind of the second phase where where we have been in the last decade 
where we've taken that exact same process and digi digitalized it to really the next phase, phase three, where we're now using um, shareable identities and, and stored digital identities. Clearly, that's where the world will be over the next decade. So we think that's a major transition for the entire industry. Uh, Adam did a nice job of articulating some of the opportunity there. Um, and you know, folks like Gartner um, believe that by 2026, half of the world's population is going to be using these shareable digital identities. That's just three years from now. Um, we, uh, you know, you and you talked a little bit about the multifaceted nature of identity, and and Adam did as well. I'll look at that from a different lens. You know, I look at an identity as being not just my, you know, who the government says I am. The government is through to trust for you know most identity systems around the world, but there's a lot of other layers on top of it. Which frequent flyer um, um, program time member of at what level? Which car rental program a member? Which um, hotel rental program is a member of? Uh, which banks am I um, subscribing to and so on? Which affinity groups? Um, all of those things make up my identity and all those things are things that um, we can store and attest to and share and so on. And those are all things that um, you know people uh, want to control who they um, share it with uh, and when. Um, so we think that's a, a, you know, clearly directionally where this goes. We think um, digital identity for us at Onfido and Airside together starts in uh, travel, given that the, um, you know, for us, the excitement around that is it's a really high stakes, high security requirement business. It's a high frequency and high volume business. So we can ramp up a number of very highly vetted profiles and very highly vetted identities and get them stored very quickly. Um, and then um, companies can, uh, you know, customers can choose to reshare those for all kinds of other scenarios, primarily in things like financial services. So we think it's a great entry point into a dramatic market shift that's happening. That's one of the most important changes going on uh, in the technology world um, across the board. And so really excited to uh, be leading the charge in this uh, changing landscape with a really strong foundation, bringing some of the most important capabilities in one of the most important use cases out of the gate. Yeah, it's that one of the exciting things about working in technology, right, is this being as part of these paradigm shifts and waves and um, given that the smartphone's really only been around for just over a de just over a decade, really, um, it's amazing to be that this new paradigm shift to what what is identity and what is identity of the smartphone and humans and user control and privacy. So, really, um, yeah, really interesting discussion. Uh, so we've got um, a bit of time to take some questions, and we've got quite a lot of questions from the audience. So we're gonna work our way through that list. Uh, so the first question is from Peter. Um, so Peter's question is, where does the original good ID come from? I think my interpretation of this question um, by good ID is the, the first binding of identity proofing to the Airside app. Um, I think, Adam? Sure, so it's a combination of aspects. Generally speaking, we are certified to an ILL2 level, which includes uh, two strong pieces of evidence. Mostly, we prefer to go back to the original database to confirm that the data of the identity matches. So, for instance, with your passport, we, you know, you, you take your passport, you scan your passport, and then you use that information to open the chip. If you can then open the chip, then you've got to basically scan your biometrics that matches the source um, picture of the chip. Then we run that chip against the good and bad chips out there. And so we know that the data, the biometric, and the document are all from a recognized data source and they all match and they haven't been tampered with. And so that's the level of security we go through. Every type of identity that we go through will go through a slightly different process, but it is largely essentially that. There's the biometrics, there's the data verification, there's the source verification, and then there's the, the binding back to the device. Uh, thanks, Adam. Um, the second question is from Louis in the UK. Uh, so Louis asks, um, I noted that when I was adding a new document to my Airside account, 
uh, the verification is done via Palace. Is this set to change uh, given Onfido's new relationship with our side? Oh, I was like, really? <laughs> Very well observed. Um, Adam, do you want to take this one? Or Mike? I was say, to answer that because it's an easy question, easy answer from my side. Yeah, so the yeah I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, it, the answer is yes, it will change. Um, obviously, we're dealing in a regulated um, system, so we need all kinds of government approvals, but those are all underway. Um, we also now have a question from Robert in Amsterdam. Um, so Robert asks, um, what do you think of initiatives uh, such as the W3C Verifiable Credentials Initiative uh, to standardize source data authentication and the related audit trail? It sounds like you're from the identity industry, Robert. <laughs> so um, Adam or Mike, would one of you like to take this? Yeah, right now, there are, um, you know, really, three different um, standards that are evolved for, um, you know, digital identities. One is an ISO standard around mobile driver's licenses. Uh, another is the verified credentials standard that you just mentioned. And the third is a standard in the uh, EU that's um, um, just being finalized right now called INOS and INOS2. Um, and so our view right now is that verifiable credentials is a really promising technology that has some um, really good attributes. Uh, the concept of you can have, um, you know, individual assertions. So, it, you know, we talked a lot about not having to share the entire identity, but being able to, if you need to just prove your age, to be able to say, yes, you know, this is this person is over the age of 18. Well, you can do that in two ways, and with a verifiable credential system. You can share just the birth date as the one attribute that you care about and say, we assess this is from this, this user. Um, or uh, as a, with another standard layer on top of that called zero knowledge proofs, we can say, we assess this person is over 18 or over 21 with, with really no information exchange, no private information exchange aside from just an assertion, a provable assertion that you are over the required limit. So we think that's a super promising technology that's been standardized and has, you know, a lot of in industry support. It doesn't yet have the um, number of relying parties that MDLs have. So, for example, the airline TSA system relies on the MDL standard, uh, and we think the uh, the EU standard of IDOS2 is going to have a, a bunch of mandated support by the EU. The EU uh, tends to take more of a stick approach than a carrot approach. Uh, so we think over the next couple of years there'll be a lot of sticks applied to that one and that will get a critical mass of adoption so you know it's certainly one of the three most important standards in the space with a lot of really um i think technically helpful attributes that um can lead to uh, a um, very high quality identity system going forward yeah i, I think I think that's the standards are important, right? That's how we all unify and figure out how do we connect, how we exchange, and there's going to be lots of standards. Um, ultimately, where we will not compromise is the privacy. And so once you've started to the point where the user is actually in control of the privacy, the source of the data, the standards, all of that can be, the system is meant to be able to handle whatever standard is necessary for whatever identity transaction there happens to be. And so it's a matter of how many standards you want to comply with at any given time. And so as Mike's saying, we comply currently with NIST, we comply currently with ISO, we comply currently with Kantera. You know, there are plans to combine with the WDC3. I mean, so it really all, the, the standards are important because that's a, those are goalposts that we can all shoot to as industries. But you have to remember from our standpoint, because the individual controls and we provide both the security and the transparency, we're actually 90% compliant with pretty much every standard that comes out there. And so for us, it's a tweaking for an individual transaction as opposed to a wholesale change that you're going to see with a lot of the other digital identity systems. Uh, thanks both for your answer. It makes sense. The standards also standardize in their own ways, especially around certain modules. Um, uh, we've had a lot of questions, so I'm just going to move on to the next one. And the next question is from John. It's interesting. He said, you've mentioned Facebook, uh, which has encountered problems uh, with identity spoofing. 
um, our Facebook accounts and Instagram accounts. And um, how does the Onfido air size solution minimize spoofing? I think it's a good one for you, Mike. I'm sure. Well, the um, the challenge with really all of the social media platforms today is they're not doing um, identity verification by and large. Uh, it's something they're all investigating and you know, all you know want to move to. If you don't verify an identity, then someone can just claim, you know, I am, you know, uh, you know, President Biden. And how would you know? <laughs> you haven't proven that, that that person's identity one way or another. Uh, we saw Twitter um, using a different um, social media platform go down a route of um, considering doing verification, but instead they chose to just simply charge a certain amount for a blue tick. Well, it turns out that the amount that they charged was less than the value as perceived by a you know malicious prankster. In this case, the the pranks were you know sort of innocent at one level, but cost companies literally billions of dollars of market cap um, because they posed as a company as being an official company account and you know put out you know what would be otherwise damaging information. And so you know just an example: if you don't do verification, then you're you know, people can claim that they are whoever they claim they are, and you have no way to confirm it. So what we would do, uh, going back to the question, is we would um, look to see if if you're trying to say, I want to prove that I'm Mike Tukin. Say, okay, well, do you have an airside stored identity? If so, that's a very high bar. And we can now say very confidently that, indeed, I am Mike Tukin because I've proven that to an IAL level two that, that uh, Adam just walked through, and in a, a click or two, boom, I have that attestation that I can link this Facebook account or this Twitter account to this very high confidence identity. Um, if you don't have an airside account, then we'd fall back to now do, using what um, Unfido has been doing for the last 12 years, which is, all right, pull out your government-issued ID, pull out your smartphone, we'll use a product that we call Motion to prove that there's a real live human being there that is Indeed, the same biometrics as the one on the uh, identity will confirm that the identity is valid. And then now we'll do that linking between that um, account, that social media account, and that real human identity. Uh, and so we can solve that for the um, already stored identity that in, in a resharable case with AirSide, or we can solve it in the de novo case. And at the end of the process, we can say, OK, Mike. Um, Welcome, and would you like to store that information to save time later? And boom, uh, save that into AirSide. That's the goal. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I think there's also a, a future-proof opportunity here. And so, we're we're we are verifying to the highest standard today, but those standards will probably be inadequate tomorrow. What giving the user control and consent is you can start piecing together pieces of information that the user can then to make their ID stronger and stronger over time. I may validate a passport, then I might validate a driver's license. Well, there's nothing stopping me from cross-correlating that, all right, well, that driver's license, I did an IA level two, I've got the verified biometrics, I'll do the exact same with that driver's license. And oh, look, they match. The name matches, the face matches, the, t the templates, and they were created on the same social security number, right? So now you've got two documents correlated by face, data, and a third piece of information. And this keeps going back and forth. And now you, you take this passport and you present yourself for, to TSA, right? And so now that passport that was verified has a live verification against it. We're not gonna share that year with their TSA, but we can, we can then say, you know what? You felt strongly enough to put this in from an officer. Therefore, that gives you some sort of points for a surety. And this, in the long run, gets to a continuous dynamic identity that really no one else has the opportunity to build except Airside and Onfido. And that's really where you start the aha moments start going. It's like, oh wait, so my my Boy Scout membership, which is garbage, has absolutely more meaning now that I've tied it to a verified identity. And so that's where you start seeing, you're building the layers of verifiable cross-correlated data with things that are voluntary and not, and you start creating this picture of a digital identity that no one else can have. And so, yes, it, it makes it almost unspoofable. And the real benefit here is, as we get more and more of this correlated data, 
uh, correlated information in the identities, not data in the sense that we access this, you know, on the profile, um, the, the confidence in the identity gets higher and higher, and therefore the, the fraud gets lower and lower. And that's a really unique approach to what we're building. Definitely. And the kind of thing that is enabled because it is user controlled and very tricky to do without it because you need the user to provide all this information to you and trust you with that information today. Um, thank you for the responses there. Uh, we're going to move on. Um, so this is uh, a, from Peter to Adam. Um, can you please talk us through how it works at the airport? Oh, absolutely. So once you've verified yourself on your airside identity, you've created a credential. And so within the AirSight app, you let's say you're going to use it with American Airlines. You go inside and you say, share my identity with American Airlines. That, it, you know, as we start adding flight numbers and other information, your, your biometric template will be placed at a single camera for however long that camera needs to hold it. So say you say, I'm flying tomorrow on flight 123 out of uh, Reagan National. Um, and you say, share. Well, your, your biometric then gets held in a single camera that allows you to walk up to the self-biometric bag drop. As soon as you do, the camera does a one-to-one -one match. Yes, I'm Adam. It allows me to then uh, drop my bag and I can go. No printing tickets, no all of these other things. I will then get a record that the camera saw me, and I will get a record that will say that I was approved. And so if you think about the, the number of touch points that, that, that can enable being bag drop, um, boarding, going through customs or going through TSA, basically with one share, you're essentially saying, I am who I say I am. I am going to walk through this touch point. And when I do, you then will have access to the rest of my information. Interesting. And um, they can try it out in person already in airports in the US? Absolutely. There are 15 airports in the United States that accept um, the airside uh, digital ID. It's actually marketed under the American Airlines mobile ID, and there's 15 airports. Um, we just opened our own express lane at America, at, um, at uh, Reagan National in Washington, D.C., so if you are a frequent flyer with pre-check, you can completely skip the line. We have our, it's two steps and you're right to security. I can, I can. I used it at DCA a couple of weeks ago. It worked absolutely transparent. It was awesome. I was like, the idea of skipping the line at the airport is the absolute dream, especially for a foreigner like me coming to the US, gosh. <laughs> um, hey, so a little bit more ooh, about the future of digital identity. This is a very interesting question from Matthew. So it says, how do you look at the future of digital portability? For example, taking my identity information from one platform to another based on preference and not being tied to a singular platform or wallet. Very right, interesting question. Uh, Mike or Adam, would I, one of you like to take this? Um, I mean, I think that's ultimately the key, right? Um, you know, you are who you are regardless of what platform you are or who's asking for the information. So you really ultimately have to be agnostic to platform. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I believe that the, you know, the there will be fewer wallets over time. Uh, it's sort of a reminiscent of the, um, you know, the, in the IT world, there used to be a whole lot of who's on top kind of questions of people are trying to create, um, you know, uh, dashboards and whose dashboard was the topmost dashboard versus, uh, it's all, I think ultimately, um, you know, honestly, the uh, the smartphone manufacturers will have, um, you know, very capable wallets that over the next five or 10 years, uh, I think the rest of the world uh, will leverage. Right now, if you were to try to add an identity to the Apple wallet or an add an attribute to it, you simply can't do it. They don't have the level of flexibility and, and third party access to allow you to do that. Um, and so as a result, there are a whole lot of other wallets that are out there. The same thing with the, the Google wallet. Um, but, you know, if you were to project forward, I believe that that um, portability scenario or that interop scenario is, um, you know, ultimately solved by the world converging on, you know, likely the inbuilt wallet for uh, whatever platform you're using. Uh, and other players like us are, you know, adding identities and adding attributes to that to enrich your personal profile um, as opposed to having to go to a different wallet to solve this problem versus that problem. 
Um, so thank you both for that. So we are um, coming up to the hour, so we've got time for one more question, and it's a super interesting one by um, Vid, from Vidit. So there are countries like India, where digital identity is being centralized by the government via server-side identity wallets. Um, in India's case, this is DigiLocker um, and the Adhara card. Do you see the centralized and decentralized model in the West coexisting? Or do you think countries like India will eventually adopt client-side decentralized wallets? Um, Mike, I think this one's for you. I, you know, I think um, depending on your timeline, I think the centralized and decentralized approach will coexist in the near term. And then uh, in the medium and longer term, I think the world converges on a decentralized, you know, purely um, you know, portable approach, because I think it's the right approach for all the reasons that um, Adam articulated earlier. Um, I think there, in the near term, there's, you know, plenty of these, you know, centralized slash server-sized approaches that are out there uh, that solve legitimate problems. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll have this coexistence. But, you know, one of the key enablers to uh, having the world converge on a, um, you know, a decentralized approach uh, is one of two things. Either the, um, you know, device wallets opening up and getting capable enough and flexible enough for the rest of the ecosystem to depend on, or um, because what that allows you to do is to have a uh, zero download or zero um, sort of other coordinating app kind of scenario, because for many uh, customers, that's a key benefit. Um, so either that scenario happens or the other scenario is um, you get a high volume entry point like travel where you, you can plan for it in advance. What's the other magical thing we didn't talk about with travel, but it's important in this context is uh, you buy your plane flight weeks in advance. You check in for it 24 hours in advance. Um, so you have multiple touch points where you can go, if you don't already have an airside ID, you can do it. And you're sitting at home on a high-speed network and you can you know, download the wallet and, and go through the process at your leisure uh, and it's just not a big deal. But you can't insert that kind of friction into a point of sale scenario. Uh, and so the question is, how can you get that um, you know, distributed set of IDs out there for these time critical scenarios. And that's where in the near term, the server side stuff will make sense. Or this you know, um, share stuff will make sense. Uh, and then you know, one of those two scenarios will you know, really drive the, um, the truly portable decentralized adoption, uh, which is clearly the long-term uh, vision. Great, um, thank you, Mike. And thank you everyone for um, the, uh, attending the webinar and your fantastic questions and engagement. Um, it's been, uh, I hope we hope you find it really informative. And of course, if you want to follow up on any of this or discover uh, or discuss it further, um, please uh, uh, contact us. Uh, I think uh, the link has been posted in the chat and of course we're contactable amongst all the normal channels. Uh, thanks again for coming and thank you very much, Adam and Mike. Thank you, Eli. Thank you.